Yes? OK, great. So um, to start off this session on stochastic block models and community detection, uh, I'll be sharing some joint work with Chris Moore, Joe Neiman, and Pranith Netrapali, who are uh, at SFI, um, uh, Microsoft Research, and University of Bonn. So um, in a lot of real-world data applications, right, we look at a network, and um, we have reason to believe that the, the nodes in the network have some sort of underlying labels or types or communities, and that moreover, this community structure should be reflected somehow in the structure of the network. Um, so for instance, if I show you the friendship graph on Facebook and you know some things about people's political affiliations, you might hypothesize that based on if those affiliations are the same or different for a particular pair of people, they'll be more or less likely to be friends. Um, and a good way to approach studying data like this is to imagine that it was generated from a particular generative model and then fit that model to the data you're looking at, right? And the literature over the past 15 or so years has generated, um, I don't know, an entire menagerie of models with community structure. Um, but the most classic one, of course, is the stochastic block model. And uh, it works like this. To generate a graph, we start with n nodes. Um, we choose some partition of these nodes into k different groups. And let's be Bayesian, so we'll, um, we'll imagine that this partition was chosen from some sort of prior distribution on possible partitions. And then the edges in the, in the network then are, um, are drawn independently so that the probability of each edge depends only on the types of its two endpoints. And so this is how the underlying communities are reflected in the network structure. And so the results that um, are in the paper that uh, I'm talking about are, are more general than what I'll share today. But for the purposes of this talk, let's focus on a particularly simple and symmetric case of this model where there are only two types of edge probabilities. So with one probability, C in over N, um, vertices of the same type will connect. And with a different probability, C out over N, vertices of different types will connect. And this 1 over n scaling puts us in an interesting sparse regime where, for instance, the number of edges is only linear in the number of nodes in the network. Um, and, and also for, for the remainder of the talk, you should assume that the partition divides the vertices into k equal sized groups and that the prior on those partitions is just uniform. Okay? Um, so it's fashionable to parameterize this model in terms of C in and C out, but instead I'd like to describe our results in terms of two slightly different parameters. And these are the average degree of the network overall, which you can compute pretty easily is C in plus K minus one times C out over the number of groups K, and I'll call this average degree D. Um, and the other parameter is gonna be something that I'll refer to as a signal strength or a signal to noise ratio. Which, is, um, which I'll call lambda and is the difference between C in and C out, and then again normalized by the number of groups times the average degree. Um, so let me point out right away that when lambda equals zero, when C in equals C out, this model reduces to the erdos rainy model, and so there's no community structure anymore. Um, on the other hand, when lambda is large, either positive or negative, this means that either C in or C out is much greater than the other one. And so now the edges in the network are actually carrying some information about the relative types of each of the two endpoints. So there's a lot of games that you can play with this model. You can try to learn these parameters. You can do all sorts of things. Um, but I'm going to be talking about two tasks in particular. And these are um, detection where I just want you to do a, a standard hypothesis testing task. I want you to be able to decide if there are communities in the network at all. Um, I.e., imagine that I flip a coin and I want to send you that bit of information, but become a, because I'm you know, a pedantic bastard, I'm not going to just text you a zero or a one. Instead, I'm going to, depending on the outcome of the coin flip, draw a graph from either the erdos renyi model or the block model and then fax it to you. Um, and I want you to be able to, just based on that graph, recover the outcome of my coin flip. right? And moreover, I want you to be able to do this with high probability. The other task is, is more of a statistical inference task where I want you to find the communities that are present in a network that I've promised to you was generated from the block model. Okay? Um, and for this one, all I want you to do is do this better than chance, so better than if you were just assigning communities to nodes at random. Um, and the reason that I only ask for better than chance is because when the networks are this sparse, you, in fact, can't do exact recovery at all. Um, and so the question we're going to ask is, as the number of nodes gets asymptotically large, for what regime of lambda and d, these signal strength and average degree parameters, is, are these tasks information, theoret information theoretically possible? In other words, if you have infinite computation time, when can you even recover the structure at all? Okay. So there are some things already known about both of these tasks, in particular that there are polynomial time algorithms to do them, 
when d is larger than one over the square of the signal strength. Um, and so there, you know, in particular, there are spectral algorithms, there are belief propagation algorithms, and we know rigorously that these work uh, in this regime based on some work by Michelle Neiman and Sly in the case where there are only two groups, and um, by Bordenave, Lalarge, and Massoulier, and also by Abbe and Sandon in the case where there are more than two groups. And in fact, when the groups, when there are only two groups, this is the information theoretic threshold. So there are polynomial times to do this task whenever, whenever either detection or recovery are information theoretically possible. And there are no algorithms that succeed below, um, below the point where the efficient ones stop working. Um, but as I said, our work is a little bit different. It focuses on this information theoretic fundamental possibility or impossibility of the hypothesis testing and statistical inference tasks. And the theorem is as follows. So when k gets large, when the number of groups gets large, um, and lambda is shrinking as about 1 over k, the information theoretic threshold is when d scales about like log k over k lambda squared. Um, and we have more exact asymptotic, or more exact results, but this is where they're, they're nice and tight in this asymptotic regime. Um, so right away you can see that because of this log k over k factor, this, this threshold actually dips below the threshold where efficient algorithms work. And based on our upper bounds, this happens when the number of groups is only five. Um, and I'll also point out that this upper bound was obtained independently um, by Abbe and Sandon, and in fact improved a little bit. So if you just want to see what these different curves look like, here they are. This is for a large enough value of k that you can really see this phenomenology nicely. Um, so this purple dashed curve is the curve um, above which there are efficient algorithms to both find communities and um, identify them when they exist. And so ab above this, the tasks are easy, we might say. Below this red line, this is our lower bound. Um, we know that both detecting and recovering communities are in the information theoretically impossible. And then above the blue line, we know that there are at least exponential, algorithm, exponential time algorithms that work. And so you can see that there's this interesting sliver here between the efficient and the information theoretic bound, where we know of no uh, polynomial time ways to do either of these things, but we also know that they're information theoretically possible. Um, any questions about this so far? Good. So for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll give you a couple of sketches and main ideas um, about where these upper and lower bounds come from. So the main tool that we use to prove these is the likelihood ratio. So um, Let's say that I show you a graph and I want to know the probability that it came from the erdos reni model. And I'll abuse notation a little bit and write that probability as, um, I apologize, uh, calligraphy G of regular G, okay? Um, where G is the graph. And so this is, this is just a product over all the edges in the graph I've shown you of the probability that each edge exists, namely the average degree over the number of nodes, times the product over all the non-edges of the probability that each of those is absent, namely one minus the edge probability. So similarly, if I, if I show you a graph and I want to know the probability that it came from the block model conditioned on the block model having been generated with a particular partition sigma, this is also a product over all the edges of the edge probabilities times a product over all the non-edges of the non-edge probabilities. Only now, each of these two probabilities depends on what that partition sigma thinks about the types of the two endpoints of each edge or non-edge, okay? And then just by Bayes' rule, to get the total probability of the graph G, we take a sum over all these conditional probabilities weighted by the prior probability of each partition. Um, and now the likelihood ratio of these two things is just the ratio of the probability that the graph came from this structured model, the block model where there are communities, divided by the probability that it came from what we might call the null model where there's, there's no structure at all. And so this is just a sum over all the conditional likelihood ratios, each weighted again by the prior probability of um, the partition that we're conditioning on. So to get an upper bound, all I need to do is tell you some test statistic that you can use to distinguish these two distributions. And let's just focus on deciding whether communities exist as opposed to finding them. Um, so the test statistic you should use, in fact, is this kind of generalized likelihood test where you maximize over all partitions the conditional probability, the conditional likelihood ratio of that partition. Um, and it's a standard first moment calculation to figure out when this quantity is noticeably lower from graphs that are generated uh, by the, the unstructured model with, um, than it is from graphs that are generated from the structured model with communities. All right. So if you just do this computation, you could all do it if you weren't working on your slides right now. Um, if you just do this, you'll find that D has to be larger than this complicated function of K and lambda for this test to work. 
Um, and if you can't do the asymptotics in your head, I know that I cannot. Um, I'll just tell you that this is about d larger than 4 log k over k minus 1 lambda squared times some corrections in the regime where lambda is pretty small. All right? Now, to get a lower bound on the information theoretic threshold, the, the main observation is that below this threshold, below the point where algorithms stop working, they fail because these two distributions, the planted and unplanted ones, or the structured and unplanted structured ones, um, in fact, behave the same. So they're, the graphs generated from the block model look exactly like the graphs generated from the artist Rennie model to any algorithm you could care to throw at it. Um, and the notion of sameness of probability distributions that it's convenient to use is this thing called contiguity. Um, so let's let uh, blackboard bold P and blackboard bold Q um, indexed by N be sequences of probability distributions. And you should think of these as just the block model and the erdos rennie model indexed by the number of vertices. Um, so given these two sequences, we're going to say that the sequence P is asymptotically contiguous to the sequence Q. If for every sequence of events um, that has pri high probability in um, the sequence of distributions P, this implies that those events have high probability in the distribution Q. And we'll call these two things mutually contiguous if this property goes both ways, all right? And then the theorem is that the block model and the erdos rennie model are mutually contiguous, um, and, and both detection and reconstruction are impossible when d is smaller than 2 log k minus 1 over k minus 1 lambda squared. And con contiguity, at least for detection, is the right thing to be thinking about here. Because imagine that I had an algorithm that with high probability could tell you exactly when a graph from the block model was generated from the block model. Well, if this property holds, then that algorithm would also have to tell you that a graph generated from the erdos rennie model was generated from the block model. And then we're kind of sunk, right? So it turns out that one direction of this mutual contiguity relation is pretty easy to prove, at least compared to the other one. Um, so let me tell you about the easy direction. Um, and the key lemma here is this nice fact that for any distributions, P and Q, and again, these are sequences, of distributions, um, if this second moment of the likelihood ratio is order one as, as n gets large, then p is contiguous to q. And this is, I'll leave it as an exercise to you, it's a one line proof, but it's very nice to kind of work out for yourself. It's basically a bunch of multiplying and dividing by things and then the cauchy schwartz inequality. Um, and, and now all you have to observe is that, um, and there's obviously a lot of math here to actually be done, but the, the, this second moment is order one whenever pairs of partitions from the posterior distribution, which I'll, I'll write as um, lowercase caps SBM of um, a partition sigma condition on a graph G, whenever pairs of draws from this distribution are uncorrelated. So this is when the second moment stays order one. You might be familiar with this from other similar second moment calculations. Um, so I know I have some time left, but um, I'll, I'll just wrap up and then we can maybe do some questions. Um, just as a coda, our results, as I said before, are more general, although less explicit in some more interesting cases of this model. So namely when the number of the, the sizes of the groups can be different or when there can be less symmetry in the edge probability. So each pair of groups could have its own different um, probability of, of generating an edge between them. Um, the other thing I'll say is that this, these kind of distinct, easy, hard, and impossible regimes, this is behavior that is, is conserved among a lot of planted inference problems, so in, you know, including noisy matrix factorization and, um, and things like that, as well as random constraint satisfaction problems like KSAT and graph coloring. Um, and finally, there's a lot of open questions here, um, not the least of which is exactly computing as opposed to just upper and lower bounding this information theoretic threshold. Um, there's also a lot of beautiful conjectures from statistical physics that I had to cut from this talk um, that still need to be made rigorous and studied further. So thank you all for your time, and I'll take any questions if you have them.